This week's episode is brought to you by Jay Mumford, a friend of the show, a longtime supporter, and a genuinely good human being. Thank you, Jay. Huh? Noise! Bad noise! Five minutes before critical mass. Critical what? Okay, okay, don't panic. Whatever problem this is, I'm sure they know how to handle it. Huh? Ah! It's my problem! We're doomed! Sector 7G is now being isolated. Uh, Mr. Burns, people are calling this a meltdown. Oh, meltdown. It's one of those annoying buzzwords. We prefer to call it an unrequested fission surplus. I am Ryan McKnight. I'm Kara Santa Maria. I am Christopher Smith. Hi, I'm Andrew Torres. This, this is Naked Mormonism. Mormonism. The Serial Mormon History Podcast. The Bennett scandal is one way to call it, I guess, has become more complex than I could have imagined. Um, (laughs) That seems to be a bit of a recurring theme in Mormon history. I try to dive into, you know, a seemingly singular topic, but it's all so interconnected and complex that it's never resolved simply or concisely. Now, Let me just take a step back here for a second. We're lucky to live in the internet era nearly two centuries after all of this went down. We have the hindsight of compiled research by hundreds of historians for over a century to parse through. But there's also a trade-off with that. The further we get from these events, the more data we have to analyze and parse through. All of that data helps us to understand at the high level what transpired. But the trade-off, though, is a breakdown of not being able to put ourselves into the minds of the people who actually experienced what was happening when it happened. We are too far removed. But we're going to try and walk that fine line today. The Bennett meltdown changed Mormon histories in ways that we can't imagine. It changed the minds of thousands of Mormons, hundreds of thousands of observers all around the world, and most importantly, Bennett's actions forever altered how Mormonism would engage in certain practices moving forward. We can't imagine what it was like to be the average Mormon who was completely ignorant of his revelations before they came to light, and then to learn about them through an expose by somebody who was one of the highest regarded Mormons in Nauvoo only months prior. We, we can't imagine it. We could never get inside their headspace. We've been setting the stage for the last few episodes when it comes to the clandestine practices of polygamy and viewing Bennett's relationship with the church and with Joseph Smith. Today we finally get to the first of his expose letters published in the Sangamo Journal, which advances our timeline into July of 1842. Bennett's exposés influenced everything for the rest of the year at at the short level, but We're going to try and view everything that transpired within the context of this whole Bennett meltdown. So today we're beginning a multi-part series on Bennett and polygamy under the banner of the Bennett meltdown. It's so complicated, and the immediate results were felt for months, and the long-lasting impacts altered Mormonism for the rest of its history. Our examination of the Bennett meltdown will by no means be exhaustive. I intend on giving all of you an overview of everything as it played out chronologically, and we'll examine the major players and their roles in the meltdown as it transpired. But I want to put a few things out of the way before we broach this subject. First, this is history, not a fantasy with simplistic good guys and bad guys. You know, this is not cowboys and Indians, as racist as that is to say. So any opinions that we may have of John Bennett, Joseph Smith, Sarah Pratt, Emma Smith, Brigham Young, Martha Brotherton, Orrin Porter, Rockwell, Orson Pratt, or anybody else that we'll be discussing throughout this Meltdown series, our opinions of them don't matter. Whatever model we have of these people in our minds of being a good guy or a bad guy, it has no bearing on what actually transpired in July to December of 1842. There's no such thing as a selfless act, and these people were acting out of, oftentimes, self-preservation in a time when that is all that mattered. 
These people's motives for their actions become quickly muddled as more variables are introduced. Each and every person saw themselves as the hero, you know, the protagonist of their own narrative. Why people did a given thing can be best understood when we think about what they had to gain or lose by making a specific decision. Second, Mormon historians are happy to throw out the line that the past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. Society is vastly different today than it was in the 19th century America, and that's unequivocally true. With that said, all these people we talk about are still people. They dealt with stresses, anxiety, happiness, anguish, deceit, gluttony, joy, and every human emotion just like all of us do. Yes, the past may be a foreign country, but the people there were still people, and they experienced all the same boundaries and limitations that we all experience. When something stresses us out or inversely makes us feel joy, those are the same exact emotions that people of the past experienced, albeit resulting from different stimuli. Third, we have the hindsight to know what would happen next, but as events transpired in real time, the people experiencing them had no idea what tomorrow held. Decisions were made that we might think irrational or ill-advised, but how could they know what the best decision in the long run would be at the time that they were making it? We know that it was another two years after this before Joe was arrested and taken to Carthage and killed, but how could he have known that? How could any of the Mormons know that Joe's life wasn't actually in danger and that the Illinois militia wouldn't be exterminating them for another three years? I mean, In order to see those events in the future, Joe would have to have the power of clairvoyancy or prophecy to know that he wouldn't die in 1842, but that doesn't seem to be the case. So with those criteria out of the way, let's get into the Bennett meltdown of 1842. July 8th, 1842 was the first issue of the Sangamo Journal that published Bennett's expose. We read the articles preceding the expose last week, so let's get into the meat of it today. Let's try to consider what may have caused Bennett to decide on writing this expose in the first place. Bennett was many things. Oftentimes, you know, it's trotted out. He was a womanizer. He was a user. He was amoral. But on the flip side, he was also a polymath. He was incredibly bright. He was motivated and and ambitious. And it just depends on who you're talking to or what data points you're using to come to those conclusions. Bennett had built a career of making the best kinds of friends in the highest of places. He'd gained a reputation as a physician and obstetrician, served on medical boards of universities, and he knew his way around vegetables and medicinal herbs. Medicine was merely an early fascination of his. Eventually, he moved to politics. He ascended to Master Mason, probably in Ohio, and there's debate about whether or not he was in good standing when he moved to Nauvoo and joined up with the Mormons. Historian and Bennett biographer Andrew Smith documents that he was kicked out of the Pickaway Lodge in 1834 for lying and other misconduct, but Bennett's History of the Saints has a letter from another Masonic Lodge claiming that he was in good standing, so it's hard to be conclusive on the issue. Possibly bored with medicine and with all the new contacts he had made in lodges and in politics, he began his foray into seriously investing into politics. He was first commissioned as a brigadier general for the 2nd Division of the Illinois State Militia, later ascending to quartermaster general. These were merely his military appointments. He had some military schooling, but he never served in combat. While rising through military ranks, his elbows were rubbed raw against prominent politicians in Illinois, where he had resided since 1838. If Bennett's long and colorful career alone paint a picture of his character— I don't think we'd be venturing out on a limb to say that he was very ambitious in his military aspirations. Whatever those aspirations may have been beyond politics and military, um, well, he was definitely driven and motivated. But now to speculate a little bit, ambitious people are capable of justifying all sorts of immoral actions to achieve their goals, all right? Bennett had come into contact with the Mormons and the Prophet back in Kirtland in 1832, but he didn't pay them much mind at that time. However, their refugee status and mass exodus to Illinois in 1839 provided all sorts of interesting opportunities. For a man like Bennett, an opportunist who was motivated and easily bored with simple endeavors, what better place to explore all sorts of new ventures, business and otherwise, than the Mormons? 
The Mormon settlement in Illinois drew all sorts of people with their own best interests at the forefront of their mind, from politicians to wealthy landowners or speculators to the lowliest grog shop merchant. The Mormons created an exciting set of prospects, and Bennett must have recognized this. His motivations for joining the Mormons are important, as they contextualize his membership and the expose. In his expose, he claimed that he joined for the sole purpose of infiltration and exposure. He only joined because he recognized what a despot Joseph Smith was, and he wanted to do what he possibly could do in order to, you know, put down this infant sovereign theocracy in an effective way. Historian Andrew Smith, and this is Bennett's most prominent biographer, wrote this of Bennett's motivation in John Cook Bennett's Nauvoo. You'll find a link to this in the show notes. Quote, the reason why Bennett went to Nauvoo was debated in 1842 and has been a topic of discussion ever since. The history of the saints opens with Bennett's explanation of why he joined the Mormon church. Bennett proclaims that he had never believed in them or their doctrines. According to Bennett, he went undercover to acquire evidence of Mormon perfidy and to witness the secret wires of the fabric and likewise those who moved them. Bennett's explanation was challenged by contemporaries. The editors of the Alton Telegraph and Democratic Review, for instance, reported that Bennett had offered, quote, the most plausible excuse his ingenuity could invent for his conduct, back to Smith. And Bennett's explanation has properly met with derisions subsequently by most historians, end quote. And of course, the Democratic Review, they were in favor of the Mormons because the Mormons were essentially opposed to the Whigs by the 1842. So that article being published out of the Alton Telegraph and Democratic Review, they had their own motivations for smearing Bennett. Now that explanation in the history of the saints of Bennett, you know, joining for the sole purpose of infiltration, that may be too generous. Maybe his wildest fantasies of power and wealth, both material and sexual, stood the best chance of being fulfilled when he hitched his wagon to Joe and the Mormons. Join the Mormons, do whatever necessary to rise to the highest possible rank. Then, when the time is right, put a plan into action that will place him atop the Holy Mormon Empire for him to rule as king. If that was his motivation, he almost accomplished it with the April military parade and sham battle. He tried to get Joe to stand in the perfect spot where a convenient little accident would befall him. And to put that into context, Bennett was poised as Joe's second-in-command and mayor of Nauvoo at the time. He would be a contending front-runner to inherit the mantle upon the prophet's death. You know, happy little accident. But think about this also. Why else would he be so militant in his affiliation with the Mormons? In his own History of the Saints, he set out the organization of the Nauvoo Legion. Quote, it is a division divided into two cohorts, or brigades, and these cohorts subdivided into regiments, battalions, and companies. The organization is intended to re represent a Roman legion. I have not space in this expose for a full rank role, and must therefore content myself with giving the names of a few of the most accomplished, brave, and efficient of the corps. End quote. Bennett took pride in the Nauvoo Legion. It was his pet project. You know, having your own private military is cool, but it's a lot cooler if you're planning on using it at some future time. But upon the failure of his orchestrated little, you know, accident to befall the prophet, realizing his reputation with Joe was tainted and the opinion of the Mormon elite was slowly shifting against him, he was in a prime position to instead gain notoriety by exposing the horrid affairs of Joe and the libertine Mormon elite. Mormon exposés had become more popular since Howe's Mormonism unveiled eight years prior in 1834. Bennett could make a handsome sum of money by publishing his book and then going on the lecture circuit. But public notoriety and social status seemed greater motivators for Bennett. Of course, with, with these motivations in mind, the more salacious his retelling, the better it would sell, right? The more he painted Joe as the villain the public wanted to view him as, the better Bennett's work would sell. Another possible motivation, Bennett sincerely believed in the religion, and once he knew the extent of Joe's horrors, he decided they needed to be exposed. We won't dwell on this possibility, but I think his track record lends itself to him never sincerely believing in Mormonism. He wasn't exactly known to give sermons on the faith. He was much more occupied with you know, battle Christ in front of the Nauvoo Legion. I mean, he was far too preoccupied with government and military affairs. He was the governmental yin to Job's religious yang. 
We should always be cognizant of Bennett's possible motives when he published his work. He had plenty of vested interest in creating the most disturbing and blackened version of Joe Smith the public had ever seen. But he was also one of the very few people in Nauvoo who had a full access pass and saw everything that happened. He lived with Joe for a year and a half. He knew everything. That made him dangerous. With all of his possible motives in mind, let's read the first of his expose letters, published in the Singamo Journal, July 1842. We're going to spend a lot of time on this, but it's very important, and we'll find out why near the end of this. The public will be astounded at the statements made by General Bennett in the article which follows from under his own hand, that in this day of light and intelligence, such a man as Joe Smith should be able to collect around him a mass of people and make them believe in his shallow and miserable scheme of imposture is a matter of astonishment now, and it will be so in after times. If only they knew. We presume that the journal has been made the medium through which General Bennett's publication has been given to the people, on the ground that the political papers of his own party, General Bennett belongs to the Democratic Party, are at this time making common cause with Joe Smith for the purpose of securing his influence in opposition to Governor Duncan and in favor of Thomas Ford. General Bennett has judged correctly that in a case like this, where the interests of morality and civil and religious liberty are so deeply concerned, to use the columns of our widely circulated paper is free to a political opponent. For some remarks of General Bennett in the article below, we are induced to believe that the people will hear further from him through the medium of this journal. Now beginning with his letter. I now write you from the Mormon Zion, the city of the saints, where I am threatened with death by the Holy Joe and his Danite band of murderers, in case I dare make any disclosures in relation to the conduct of that polluted mass of corruption, iniquity, and fraud, that king of impostors, the holy and immaculate Joe Smith. I shall, however, expose him, and if I fall by the ruthless hands of such foul assassins, let my blood be avenged by the friends of God and my country." Remember, he has threatened me with death in propria persona, in person. And if I should be immolated to satiate his hellish malice, let his blood atone for it. Put his head in a charger. But I fear him not. He is a most consummate blackguard and dastardly coward. He is ready at all times to assassinate a man of equal corporeal strength or to inflict corporeal punishment on a man of a feeble frame but he fears his equals and dreads his superiors. Joe Smith stands indicted for murder, treason, burglary, and arson in Missouri, and he defies the laws and the legally constituted authorities to deliver him over for trial. What a horrible state of society when men fear to execute the laws, especially in relation to the most foul imposter that ever disgraced the earth. If Governor Reynolds of Missouri will make another demand for Joe Smith alone, disconnected with any other person, for there are thousands of innocent, unoffending, good, and holy people among the Mormons who never ought to suffer and never shall by my hands or through my instrumentality, men, women, and children who have suffered more than death for the infamous prophet, and if Governor Carlin will place the right in my hands, I will deliver him up to the justice or die in the attempt unless restrained by the constituted civil authority. Thousands and tens of thousands are ready to obey the call and enforce the laws, and the Holy Joe shall tremble at the sight of gathering hosts. Let the watchword pass with the celerity of lightning, and let the citizen soldiers be ready. I will lead you on to victory and lay the rebels low. The Constitution and the laws shall triumph, and misrule violence and oppression wither like a blighted flower. Let not an executive whom he has vilified and abused as he has Governor Carlin, both in private circle and public congregation, fear or neglect to do his duty in the case and deliver up this noted refugee charged with the blackest crimes known to the laws who now boldly stalks abroad in our public ways. If Joe was innocent... Let him be acquitted, but if he is guilty, let his life atone for it. I regard him as a foul and polluted murderer, and on the forthcoming of the state writ, Joe shall be delivered up. Now remember that if I should be missing, 
Joe Smith, either by himself or his Danite band, will be the murderer. Illinoisans, then let my blood be avenged. They seek my life by day and by night. Look well to the issue. I am in the infamous impostor's city, but I fear him not. Neither do I regard his idolatrous God. He believes not in the God of heaven, and I fear no other. I now defy him and all his holy hosts. I dare him to personal violence. There are eyes that see that he knows not of, and ears to hear that he understands not. Now, governor, do your duty, and citizens of Illinois, be in readiness to sustain your laws. I furnished the state arms to the Nauvoo Legion on a legal requisition, and on a legal requisition they shall be delivered up. The public arms are in bad condition and suffering material injury, and they had better be placed in the hands of more deserving men, for the state is sustaining a great loss. If the governor wishes them for other troops, they are at his service. I derived the command of the Nauvoo Legion, and as Major General, I have it, and are liable to trial only on an order from the governor detailing a general court-martial of general officers from the other divisions of the state. No brevet officer can affect me. It is true that I had Joe Smith appointed, or elected, Lieutenant General, as a mere plaything, knowing that there was no such officer contemplated by the Constitution, but... It answers Joe well enough, as he does not know enough of military matters to tell the difference between a corporal and a general. So Lieutenant General is as good as any other Raoul to Joe. You get it? Corporal? General? In his speeches, he says, Hear your Lieutenant General, the greatest military commander that ever lived since the days of Washington. General Scott is a mere pygmy compared to me. I command all the armies of the United States, and the Nauvoo Legion was formed to avenge blood in Missouri. Joe is a great man of the kind, but God will damn the kind, for if the devil don't get Joe Smith, there is no use for any devil. But to the damnable iniquity of this base impostor, and to begin. That was the introduction. That was just to set people in the right state of mind for what he is now going on to print. Because after that introduction, it reprints the letter exchanges where they excommunicate John C. Bennett. They aren't important, so we're going to skip them to the next important section, where it talks about the excommunication announcement. Bennett provides commentary on why it was released, when it was, and claims that some of the signatures were forged. Now it happens that John E. Page was in Pittsburgh, William Smith in Pennsylvania, and Lyman White in Tennessee at the above date. This is the way the Holy Joe does business. On Saturday, the 18th of June, I was excommunicated from his holy sect. Now look at the dates. On the 18th day of June, I was excommunicated. On the 17th of May, previous, I withdrew from his noble band of brothers. The withdrawal of fellowship was dated back in order to have a pretext for my expulsion and to destroy my influence before I could do any injury to the great prophet and was presented to Orson Pratt, one of the twelve, for his signature some days after I showed him my official withdrawal, and Mr. Pratt refused to sign it. Mr. Pratt is a gentleman of undoubted veracity, and I am willing to abide his testimony. Call upon him, Mr. Editor, and what think you of these extraordinary papers? What was all this for? I will tell you it was to destroy my influence." before I should expose Joe's attempts at seduction. Many of his followers will swear to anything that he desires them to, and think they are doing God's service, even when they know it to be false. Yeah, the, the excommunication, that's pretty standard operating procedure in the church when somebody is labeled an excommunicant, an apostate, an anti-Mormon, as Bennett was immediately upon his departure. Well, suddenly... Mormons are quick to completely disregard, dismiss everything that the person says. You raise up a stink against the leadership of the church, they excommunicate you. Suddenly, anything you say just doesn't matter. Protect Elias' children, people. Bennett continues on his numbered list of accusations against Joe and the Mormons. And I'm not going to read all of them. Some of them are a little redundant here, but uh, we're, we're going to read most of them, actually. So let's get into number second. 
Joseph Smith, the great Mormon seducer, one who has seduced not only hundreds of single and married females, but more than the great Solomon, attempted to seduce Miss Nancy Rigdon, the eldest single daughter of Sidney Rigdon, to submit to his hellish purposes and become one of his clandestine wives under the new dispensation. Now, that's a pretty outlandish claim, don't you think? One who has seduced not only hundreds of single married females, but more than the great Solomon? That Joe has... You know, has more than 300 wives and, uh, you know, 700 concubines as the great Solomon. It's pretty tall order there. Um, yeah, needless to say, that doesn't exactly help his credibility. But the point that he's getting at is that Joe fabricated this system for the sole purpose of being like the great Solomon and having as many wives as he saw fit. His hellish purposes, his clandestine wives under the new dispensation. And of course, he does invoke Miss Nancy Rigdon because there is unequivocal evidence that he had collected that other people were well aware of and that was a well-substantiated rumor around Nauvoo that Joe had proposed to Nancy Rigdon and she confronted him about it in front of Sidney Rigdon. It's quite fascinating. So he goes on to say, Call upon Miss Rigdon, who repulsed him with commendable firmness, and I will abide her testimony. Call likewise upon General George W. Robinson and Colonel F. M. Higby, Francis M. Higby, to state what they know upon this subject. General Robinson and Colonel Higby can tell some astounding facts in relation to this matter. Joe approached Miss Rigdon in the name of the Lord and by his authority and permission, as he said. Joe attacked Mr. Rigdon, General Robinson, Colonel Higby, and myself in order to destroy the influence of all of us to prevent the exposition of his case. But it is all true, and the legal evidence shall be forthcoming. Call upon Miss Martha Brotherton of Warsaw and see what she will say as to the base attempt at seduction in her own case— she can tell a tale of woe that would make humanity shudder. Call upon Miss Mitchell of this city, one of the most chaste and spotless females in the West, and see what she knows as to the prophet's secret wives. Hundreds of cases can be instanced, and if the Danites do not murder me, you shall hear a tale of pollution and sorrow. Joe's licentiousness is unparalleled in the annals of time. I have the evidence, and it shall come, and no attacks on me to divert the public mind from himself, and his iniquity shall avail him. My purpose is fixed, and the world shall know who the great impostor is. Time will not permit my going into further detail in this letter, but an abused and insulted public shall know all about it. Number third. Joe's extensive land frauds in Iowa and Illinois will soon come to light. I will save his eastern creditors some hundreds of thousands of dollars by exposing these frauds in the lace of open day, both by legal records of the county and oral testimony. All is in readiness. What is interesting is, in almost every one of these points, he says, I have the information. I have this information. It will soon come to light. All of this is in readiness. It did. The History of the Saints produced all of this information. Now, you can go on and smear Bennett's character and say that he fabricated all of it, that he was publishing this first expose as a teaser to test the waters, test the market for how well-received the expanded edition, you know, the full expose, the History of the Saints would be received once he had it, and that everything after that was a fabrication. But, well, needless to say, there's a surprising amount of his information that's contained in the history of the saints that is corroborated from outside documentary evidence and from journal entries. So him saying that I have this information, that all of it is in readiness, I have the evidence and it shall come, and no attacks to on me to divert the public mind from himself, <laughs> and his iniquity shall avail him. That must have terrified the leadership. I mean, try to put yourself in that position. What what do you do when somebody who used to be your close bosom friend, you know, your closest confidant living with you, a housemate, a bosom friend, knows all your dirtiest secrets and then goes on airing out all your dirty laundry? That's absolutely terrifying for Joe and the leadership. You can understand how... The information contained herein and the information teased and alluded to in uh, some of these points may have caused them to go into complete panic and survival mode. Fourth, I will expose his actings and doings in Nauvoo Lodge when none but the Mormon brethren were present, that he, Joe Smith, and five others were entered, passed, and raised before the lodge was installed by the Grand Master 
and that they all passed through a second time afterwards, with the exception of one who is now abroad, and many other like irregularities and departures from the ancient landmarks. He has likewise established a new lodge of his own by inspiration, called Order, that's the Holy Order, the Anointed Quorum, in which there are many curious things, and relative to which I have much to say hereafter. The following is a part of the obligation— I furthermore promise and swear that I will never touch a daughter of Adam unless she is given me of the Lord, so as to accord with the new dispensation and the ancient order of things. Okay, so that is Bennett's way of signaling to the Masons in Illinois that Joe installed a lodge. He is not operating by the orders of the Royal Arch Masonic Order or any of the other orders that would approve of their ascendancy, and that he was running through Masons like crazy, that they all passed through, and then a second times immediately afterwards. See, the thing is, is that most Masonic lodges met or currently meet only once a month, and then you, when you're ascending through the Masonic degrees, you go to one of these, and you're, and you know, you you ascend to the entered apprentice, the first degree. And then you come to another couple of, of lodges, you know, a few months down the road and you continue to come and eventually you, you know, you ascend to Master Mason. What the Mormons were doing is meeting every single day and ascending Mormons almost immediately every day. They were running them through the lodge the first time, you know, getting them to the entered apprentice level and then running them through the second time in a day, getting them up to fellow craft. And that is not the way the Masons like to do this. And what that did was make it so that by 1844, I believe it was, there were more Mormon Masons living in Illinois than there were Masons in the rest of the state. Masons really, uh, I can imagine that the Masons of the time probably weren't too excited about this, especially with him saying he called this order, you know, this clandestine, his own version of the Masonic ascendancy ritual and the holy order of the anointed, the, his own endowment ceremony. That's, uh, well, <laughs> if you are a Mason and you're hearing this information for the first time that Joe is wielding all sorts of power and he's appropriated the Masonic rituals for his own purposes, that he's revealing them to people who are not fellow trusted ascended Master Masons, yeah, suddenly that's a threat. So this is, this is a signal to every population, every type of person, Joseph Smith is a problem. Number fifth. The attacks on me and the Wasp are all for public effort and to divert the public eye from Joe's infamous conduct. My affidavit as taken before Esquire Wells, Daniel H. Wells, and my statements before the city council in relation to the Holy Joe were made under duress. My life was threatened unless I submit to the requisition of Joe. <laughs> there you go. His, uh, his affidavit then. Uh, well, we, I believe we read it previously, but um, yeah, his affidavit, his signing that he resigned from the church, all of that. He's saying that that was all made under duress. I then preferred the course I took to death, as I knew the public were not apprised of the facts, and I could have been murdered and no person would have been the wise. But the public are now apprised of the matter, and I am ready and willing to die in exposing this impious man, and the people will avenge my blood." I never feared death, but I chose not to die before I rendered God and the people signal service in bringing to light the hidden things of darkness. But more of this hereafter. And it's such a stand-up guy, right? He signed his order. He signed his his resignation from mayorship and from the you know the membership of the church because he knew that he was opposed to Joseph Smith. Joe knew that he was opposed to himself, and he was going to die if he didn't sign that. So he took that course instead of death, signed his oath, and then decided, I'll go expose everybody, or I'll, I'll expose this information to everybody, and then afterwards I'll have that leverage. I'll have that public notoriety to keep me secure. And, uh, you know, if I died before exposing the iniquities, then nobody would be any the wiser. I would be, you know, fed to the catfish. It's, it's quite fascinating. I, I mean, it all just plays into his possible motivations for this. Number six, the whole city is now in an uproar in relation to the doctrine of consecration as taught on yesterday. The people are all required to come forward and consecrate all their property to the Lord by placing it at the apostles' feet or in the hands of Joe Smith. There is much flouncing on this subject. And what will be the issue? God only knows. I will give you some important facts in my next communication. 
number seventh. The life of Captain Amos Davis, with some others, has been threatened, as well as my own, and I hereby put the public on the lookout. I will write you as time permits. In haste, yours respectfully, signed John C. Bennett. Now, to summarize that, there is a bit of a postscript here, and I think this postscript is fascinating. We have another communication from General Bennett. Its disclosures are horrible. We shall publish it in an extra as soon as possible. Joe Smith and Ford's friends are uniting their forces to destroy the weight of Bennett's evidence. This is as we anticipated. We shall give in our next some account of the origin and objects of the Danite Band of Mormons, to which General Bennett refers in his communication. The Danite Band of Mormons. I mean, just take a step back. There's so much going on, right? You have this clandestine group of leaders that are running this theocracy on the Mississippi. They have every license afforded to them written into the Nauvoo Charter. They have politicians in their pockets. Joe has an entire harem of wives. They have the Nauvoo Legion, their own military police force, legally sanctioned by the state, supplied by John C. Bennett from the state's militia armory. And now you have this, this, it's not an illusion, it's a direct invocation of the Danites, something that the public became aware of in, you know, in, with respect to the 1838 Mormon War in Missouri, thanks to Dr. Samson Avard and William McClellan acquiring the documentation and Samson Avard and Thomas B. Marsh's testimonies on the stand, and all of those documents, all of the Missouri court documents being published at the beginning of 1841, the public were well aware that the Danites existed. A lot of people had heard rumors that the Mormons had their own, you know, underground police force, their black ops. Now we say right here as a postscript, following the everything that John C. Bennett said, the Singamo Journal says, <laughs> our next account is going to tell everything you need to know about the Danite band of Mormons. <sighs> Pandora's box was open, people. What could be done? Now, Joe and the leadership couldn't let this persist, right? They knew Bennett had been collecting statements and he had been exchanging letters for the entire month of June. He had enough data to utterly collapse this burgeoning Mormon empire. This letter alone understandably could have done enough damage to topple the kingdom. And it was only the beginning. What would he reveal about the Danites in the next edition? This expose was out there now being consumed by thousands, being passed among groups of friends with no more copies remained for sale. How would the public react? These are questions that Joe and the leadership had to ask themselves. With Now that so many public rumors about the Mormons had been just confirmed by this expose, what new rumors would spawn from these two simple pages? Given all of the articles printed in the same edition with so much information about the Mormons' political power, what would Bennett's expose do to the mass of politicians that were hanging at the end of Joe's puppet strings? So I ask again, what could be done? If you're Joe and you don't want this information getting out there, what do you do? Bennett stated explicitly that if he goes missing, that everybody will know what happened, that they should avenge his blood. I mean, he'd been followed around by Danites while he was compiling his data, and accidents happened a lot in Nauvoo. Luckily, Bennett was spending most of his time in June in Warsaw, and home of the Warsaw Signal and the anti-Mormon political party. John Bennett was a Martin Luther in Warsaw, all right? That was his Germany. He was kept in safe asylum from the ruling theocracy that was 30 miles north. But a little bit of bad food, a tragic fall from a horse, simply disappearing from a party and nobody remembers when they last saw him. It, see, Joe's problems had a way of working themselves out. But Bennett had enough public visibility at this time that his disappearance would immediately result in an Illinois militia knocking on Nauvoo's doorstep. The Mormons, or at least Joe Smith, weren't seen in a favorable light if they were before. But beyond that, the very next article after Bennett's expose revealed a clever new word that people were using that really drove the point home of how powerful Joe and the Mormons were being, were becoming, I should say. Bogsed. This is a new word for assassination. 
The incident given in the following paragraph from the Alton Telegraph, we have heard stated from other sources. It is unquestionably true. What better should we expect from men who implicitly follow the direction of leaders, who in the case of Governor Boggs pronounced a murder, a noble deed? A Mormon in Brown County, after Governor Duncan addressed the people of that county, remarked, If Governor Duncan doesn't look out, he'll be bogged. Are we to understand from this that Governor Duncan is to receive the same sad fate lately visited by some unknown assassin upon ex-Governor Boggs in Missouri? If not, why the threat that if he did not look out, he would be bogged? By taking Governor Duncan's life, the Mormon candidate Judge Ford may succeed in being elected. But if his life is spared, the citizens of Illinois will put a veto upon political Mormonism that we trust will effectually efface it from Illinois. I mean, that is an incredible report. According to this, Duncan was giving a speech and presumably a Mormon told him, watch your back or you're going to get bogged. Bogged. A new buzzword coined solely to convey how powerful Joe and the Mormons were with a single word used derisively to instill fear in the minds of anyone not already afraid of the Mormon encroachment into Illinois politics and their clandestine Black Ops Society of Danites. The Boggs issue was becoming increasingly pressing at this time. It was only a matter of time before a posse out of Missouri made their way across the Mississippi into the boundaries of Nauvoo and demanded the arrest of Joseph Smith and Pistol Pack and Porter Rockwell. This was a constant fear plaguing Joe and influencing his decisions. The amount of stress this must have put on them. Boggs had recovered consciousness, and he swore out the affidavit calling on Governor Thomas Carlin to extradite Joe and Port to Missouri for a hearing on the assassination attempt, in addition to all of the whole Missouri conflict in 1838. Whether or not Port pulled the trigger, and regardless of whether or not Joe told Port to make his problems go away, you know, leading to that incident, the public believed that Port did it at the command of Joe. Any jury hearing in Missouri would inevitably be tainted by the public's opinion of the Mormons in Missouri. They would never have a fair trial there. Guilt wouldn't matter. The jury of public affection had rendered their case a kangaroo court before the arrest even happened. We'll get into this in the coming weeks, but Joe had a lot riding on preserving things the way they were before Bennett's expose. He had a pretty sweet spot atop the kingdom on the Mississippi, with all of the land and women and political wealth to fill 33 lifetimes. He would take whatever measures necessary to keep that status from being tarnished in any way. But he simply couldn't stem the tide. Joe had destroyed a number of powerful relationships among Mormon elites with his system of celestial marriage. Orson Pratt had just learned of Joe and Bennett fighting over Sarah Pratt, and we're going to talk about that in a coming episode. And Sidney Rigdon was completely fed up with Joe, the final straw being Joe, you know, locking Nancy Rigdon, you know, Hinchpin Rigdon's eldest single daughter, in a room and keeping her there until she agreed to the marriage or swore herself to secrecy on the matter. All of these were still tightly kept secrets of Nauvoo, but Bennett knew all of them, and it was only a matter of time before his expose trotted out exactly what had happened behind those sacred closed doors. The public exploded with these disclosures. Joe and friends tried to get ahead of the meltdown by publishing an article in the Times and Seasons, and that was, you know, about Bennett's excommunication. I didn't read that out of the expose, but it was. It was printed out there, and then it was picked up and reprinted by the New York Evening Post, the Brooklyn Daily Eagle, and a number of other outlets beginning on July 9th, and it reads as follows. Excommunicated, extraordinary. General Bennett, who has been a commander of the Nauvoo Legion, has been thrown over the wall by Mormon dignitaries. The last number of the Times and Seasons of the Mormon Oregon, published at Nauvoo, contains the following bull. Notice, the subscribers, members of the First Presidency of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, withdraw the hand of fellowship from General John C. Bennett as a Christian, he having been labored with from time to time to persuade him to amend his conduct, apparently to no good effect. Signed by Joseph Smith, Hiram Smith, William Law, and nine members of the quorum, and three bishops. But it was to no effect, okay? The fire had started, and it was already raging. This little cup of water did nothing to mitigate the damage. 
papers all across the country picked up the Singamo Journal. What excitement lay dormant concerning the Mormons since their exodus from Missouri was quickly reignited in the minds of Americans all across the Grand Fruited Plain. First came the Alton Telegraph, out of Alton, Illinois. It began with an extensive article by Professor J.B. Turner and his new expose history book titled Mormonism in All Ages or the Rise, Progress, and Causes of Mormonism, with the biography of its author and founder, Joseph Smith, Jr., He needed a better editor, let's just say. But this book has been cited by historians ever since. And this article that was printed out of the Alton Telegraph printed a very brief sketch of the historiography. And I actually found a copy of this historiography on archive.org. And here's just a little taste from the introduction. This is from Turner's Mormonism in All Ages or the Rise, Progress, and Causes. The Mormons boast of 100,000 adherents in this country and more than 10,000 in Great Britain, where their faith is making rapid progress. This may be an exaggeration, but at all events, it is time the absurdities of their scheme were exposed. They are, in truth, the most dangerous and virulent enemies to our political and religious purity and our social and civil peace, and now exist in the Union, not so much, however, on the ground of their direct as of their indirect influence." The ravages in the front of their march are far less to be dreaded than the moral pestilence which follows them. The bubbles of fanaticism, it is true, leap and sparkle around their prow, but the dull and sullen waves of atheism roll and spread wide in their wake behind. It has ever been true that they have made 100 infidels to every dozen converts. There is much reason to believe that many of their popular leaders are at heart infidels. So that's just a little taste of the introduction. Of course, once again, the more salacious, the more exciting you make the expose about the Mormons, the better it's going to sell. But the article that was, you know, talking about that in response to examining this new expose by Turner said this, quote, Personally, we know but little of the Mormons as a sect or of the laws which govern them as a distinct political community. The cruel hardships, unmerited as we did then and still do believe, to which they were subjected at the time of their forcible expulsion from Missouri, excited our liveliest sympathy. And the partial acquaintance which we have since formed with one or two of their number has most certainly not prejudiced us against them. But... We must nevertheless say that a candid and attentive perusal of the work before us, that's Turner's Mormonism, has compelled us to come to the conclusion that they are most basely misrepresented and slandered, or that they are parties to and the dupes of the most vilest imposture that ever preyed upon the credulity of poor fallen men. Then the Alton Telegraph goes on to reprint the entire Singamo Journal article including Bennett's expose. The next article came from the Commercial Advertiser and Journal out of Buffalo, New York, on July 11th. The Mormons. With whatever feeling we may regard the religious delusion under which the Mormons labor, if we can believe the Western papers, it is no longer safe to treat the movements of the sect with contempt. Their peculiar organization is an anomaly and demands attention— It has in it most dangerous elements. Their city of Nauvoo has several thousand inhabitants who constitute an imperium in imperio, nominally recognized the civil authority of the state and nation, but in reality exercising some of the highest attributes of sovereignty. They have a large and highly disciplined military force, and their whole moral and physical power is swayed by one mind with tremendous effect. It is easy to see that with such an organization the Mormons may become a mighty engine of ill— It is charged in some of the Western papers that they have among them a band called Danites, selected on account of their blind, fiery zeal and fanaticism, who are sworn to do the bidding of their prophet, Joe Smith, and are the ready instruments of his vengeance. It is more than insinuated that the recent attempt to assassinate ex-Governor Boggs of Missouri was the work of some members of this band. We take no pleasure in placing these remarks upon paper, If a secret band of assassins shall prowl about among this community, who is safe? The fate of Governor Boggs is an event not to be unheeded. The Boston Post caught wind of the rising schism and conflict before they had a copy of the Sangamo Journal. They printed this on July 14th. Trouble among the Mormons! We understand by a private letter from Montrose that Joe Smith had a quarrel with Rigdon and Bennett. 
and that he had turned both the latter out of the synagogue. Some hard swearing passed between these saints during the quarrel. Bennett threatened to write a book for the purpose of exposing the rascality of this pretender to a spirit of prophecy. We hope the schism is incurable, as it is said to be. It goes on and on and on, just like that. The Baltimore Sun, the Hartford Courant, Southwestern Farmer out of Mississippi, the Raleigh Microcosm, the Cincinnati Enquirer. That's just for the first week and a half after the Sangamo Journal published its first of Bennett's letters. These were the sparks flying in all directions, soon to ignite the surrounding kindling and bring Mormonism to the forefront of every person's mind. I'll read one more of these articles for all of you and explain why afterwards. This is out of the Alton Telegraph from Illinois on July 16th. We hope the length of the Mormon exposures by Dr. Bennett will not prevent any man from reading them. We are beset by dangers which call for immediate and prompt action. We entreat every man to read the statements of Bennett, and after he has done so, lend it to his neighbor. Unless Mitt Romney... <laughs> uh, sorry about that. Unless Judge Ford is defeated for governor, Mormonism will be triumphant in the state, and no man will be secure in either his life, liberty, or property. This expose is important. We'll get to that in a minute, but the lasting impacts this expose had, the cleansing effect it created within the ranks of believers, it altered Mormon history forever. The length may be off-putting at first, as Alton Telegraph said, but each line read is more crucial than the last. Which is why we've taken so long to go down this rabbit hole thus far, and we're only now beginning to explore the crevasses contained therein. This expose caused a massive evaluation of who could and could not be trusted, who was allowed into the anointed quorum, the holy order, which Bennett was not, who was allowed backstage passes to celestial marriage. This expose caused the collective Mormon psyche to become more guarded and careful than ever before. Who would be the next angry apostate? Who was a wolf in priest's clothing? Were secrets safe anymore? And I want to comment on that very briefly. We hope the length of the Mormon exposures will not prevent any man from reading them. These are important. It takes a bit of time to get through this. There's a lot of data, a lot of information to get through. That's why I'm reading through the entire thing on the, the Patreon-only feed. You know, Patreon.com slash Naked Mormonism. If you want to hear the audiobook version of this, along with my commentary peppered through, it's fascinating. It's dense. There's a lot of information there. Um, um, some of it has been, you know, published long before Bennett ever came along. You know, huge extracts are taken out of Mormonism unveiled. But it is so important. This expose and understanding it in its entirety within the context from whence it came of 1842 Nauvoo Mormonism, the most incredibly theological, exciting and diverse era of Mormonism the most theocratic and despotic point within church history where they nearly where Joseph Smith nearly accomplished building a religious empire the length of the mormon exposures should not prevent us from reading them read it lend it to your neighbor like this is important and to put this into even more context, as if the Bennett meltdown didn't reveal enough cracks in the foundation of Nauvoo Mormonism and threaten the public stability of the empire. Complicating matters further, Joe's outstanding debts were completely crushing him. Now, he was making a number of decisions for the sole purpose of answering all of his defaulted payments. Horace Hotchkiss, that was the guy who sold a huge chunk of the lands and commerce to Joe on completely insane terms. He was growing a bit insistent that Joe pay him the balance owed. Joe had been exchanging land deeds in Kirtland and Missouri just to pay the interest on Hotchkiss's bills, but the accumulated capital was nowhere near enough to satisfy the debts, in spite of what Joe claimed repeatedly. Hotchkiss, Gillett, Tuttle, and plenty of other land speculators were holding the deeds to Mormon lands until they were paid in full, and all of them were becoming less tolerant of Joe's constant defaulting. 
they were concerned for understandable reasons, right? The the influx of Mormons wanting the most prime land nearest the temple or, you know, next to the prophet's block, they were driving up land prices. That coupled with improvements the Mormons were making. I mean, this area was previously just a swampland that was continually, you know, being improved and built upon. That was driving up land prices even more. The owners of these land deeds were responsible to the government for paying the property taxes, and those were increasing as land values increased. So Joe, as trustee and trust of the Mormon settlement and the church at large, defaulting on his payments was causing a lot of conflict and stress added to the overwhelming lack of money and prevailing destitution of the populace at large. Beyond that, just a year prior, Isaac Galland had apparently absconded with enough land deeds and specie to pay a significant portion of the Hotchkiss debt, but he was apparently no longer to be found around town. Galland had been a bit of a rascal from the beginning, you know, selling the Mormons his portion of the half-breed tract in the Iowa Territory when he never rightfully held the land titles. So he's another opportunist guy who apparently chose to capitalize on the Mormon refugee crisis and then just GTFO as soon as his feet were held to the fire to make good on his promises. All of that included here, thanks to that convenient little Federal Bankruptcy Act passed in 1841, Joe and dozens of Mormon elites just filed for bankruptcy. So, to conclude this same 8th of July issue of the Sangamo Journal, where this expose was initially published, there was a page and a half of exclusively bankruptcy notices. Now, this is how bankruptcy worked in the 19th century. They'd simply publish in the newspaper when a person filed for bankruptcy, and they would print the date of their court appearance, and all of their creditors would appear in the state court on that day assigned in order to file debts on the person who was declaring bankruptcy. This is what they read like, In the matter of the petition of Godfrey Schisler, a bankrupt, to be discharged from his debts, notice is hereby given to all creditors and others interested of Godfrey Schisler, a bankrupt, to appear before the District Court of the United States on the first day of October 1842 at the City of Springfield in the District of Illinois, and shoe cause, if they have any, why the aforesaid Godfrey Schisler should not receive a final discharge from all his debts and a certificate thereof granted to him, dated at Springfield this 17th day of A.D., June 1842, and then it's signed S. Strong Solicitor solicitor for petitioner. Names go on for a page and a half out of this, uh, you know, this issue of the Sangamo Journal, this July 8th, 1842 issue, this earth-shattering version, uh, volume of the, the Sangamo Journal, and the names just go on and on. You, Charles Gilbert, Burgess Moody, Jarriet Robinson, John Griffin, Charles Edmonds. You get the point. At the end of the last page, It has the same bankruptcy notices printed for Reynolds Cahoon, Vincent Knight, Elias Higby, Henry G. Sherwood, John P. Green, Jared Carter, Amos Davis, Sidney Rigdon, and all remaining living Smith brothers, William Samuel H. Smith, Hiram Smith, and Joseph Smith. All of them had filed bankruptcy. All of those Mormon elites, every single name that I just read has come up sometime in our timeline, most of them affiliated from the Kirtland era. All of them had filed for bankruptcy. And at the end of this same issue of the Sangamo Journal, journal, all of them were called to appear in the Springfield Court on the first day of October 1842. Think about that. What what a wonderful opportunity this would present to voice a person's concerns directly to the highest leadership authorities of Nauvoo Mormonism. The prophet himself will be there. And the first counselors, the patriarch of the church, they'll all be there. The whole presidency, a number of the, the apostles are going to be there. October 1st promised to be an exciting day in Springfield, should they all choose to show up for their bankruptcy hearing. You think they showed up? We're going to find out soon. What we need to understand and take away from all of this is that every decision made by Joe and the other leaders from this time forward was purely reactionary, right? Joe and the rest of the Mormons were able to spin this as religious persecution, but that only held so much water. Bennett's expose wasn't an affront to Joseph Smith. It was a direct attack on the one true gospel and God's humble servant. 
This quaint little city of Nauvoo was now under complete ideological siege from anti-Mormon mobocrat propaganda trying to destroy the sect all over again, just like a few years ago in Missouri. We can't put our minds there. We can't hear the rhetoric today, the way that it was spewed from the pulpit. We can't understand what it must have been like to be a believing Mormon living in Nauvoo and reading this expose. Every Mormon had some hard decisions to make upon reading this first issue of the Sangamo Journal, conscious and subconscious. First, do they even pick it up, right? Do you, do you read this or do you say you heard about it and you think it's all propaganda? It's anti-Mormon lies. You don't even pay attention. I mean, do, if they read it, first off, do they let the information stay in their brain for longer than a fleeting second? Do they entertain the thought that the expose is true and that Joe is just as deplorable of a human being as the journal had portrayed him to be? Now, it's much easier for the brain to subconsciously engage survival mechanisms, you know, build a virtual shell around the brain. Some scary information can get in, but I'm going to plant my head firmly back in the sand to make sure no more scary information gets past this, you know, walling off survival mechanism. That's easy to do in the short term. And we can be sure it was likely what the vast majority of Mormons did, or else a major upheaval would have transpired and the remaining years of Joe's life would not look like they currently do. They probably would have ended at that time. But for the rest of the Mormons who overcame that survival mechanism, they allowed their brains to chew on this new information. Those who were opposed to Joe and his theocracy building and everything entailed in that expose they had a hard set of decisions to make. What could they do? This person who, you know, was open-minded enough to let these rumors be substantiated in their mind, these rumors they'd only heard about whispered behind closed doors, now they were all evidenced by John C. Bennett, one of the highest-ranking Mormon elites. What did they do? This, this person could come to the conclusions, the, the same conclusions of the rest of the world that Joe was an imposter and he was deluding the Mormons for his own selfish aggrandizement. Or, you know, think something along the lines of, well, he's doing good. You know, what he's doing, he's doing as a man, not a prophet. He's a fallible man. He's still divinely inspired. The Book of Mormon is true. Even if Joe has, you know, departed from the covenant path in some respects, he's generally a good person, but he sometimes acts as a man, sometimes as a prophet. You know, the, the, this person could keep following Mormonism with this new information and then have that mature faith we've heard bandied about lately in the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon, regardless of what Joe or the other leadership was doing. Or you leave. That person could leave. They could leave their friends. They could leave their family, leave their community, leave all of their land, their property, leave it all behind and deal with the fact that the last X number of years of their life have been a waste and that Joe had swindled them. He had taken their money and he caused the person untold pain, anguish, and trauma just to accomplish his own selfish desires. What would you do in that situation? There are other decisions that could have been made, and they're largely contingent on the mentality of the person making the decision. The most terrifying, though, in my mind anyway, that's the person who didn't know about the truth of Joseph Smith and then dealt with this information contained in this and the remainder of the exposés with acceptance, possibly even joyful, gleeful acceptance. Joe was the one true prophet. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ, and in whatever direction the prophet leads us, that is the will of God. Joe has told us repeatedly that if he leads us astray, that God will remove him. Well, Brother Smith is still alive, so this must be the true church and the path that God wants us to walk. Joe could shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue and not lose a follower. If Joe is a vicious dictator, affecting his will by a black ops underground militia, he's doing that to build Zion, the new Jerusalem on the American continent, so that when the Savior returns, he'll reign over the new dispensation as God King on earth. Anything Joe and the leadership did was to convert the Gentile world to the one true gospel. Any action, polygamy, murder, overthrow of the government, any action was justified because 
They are building the kingdom of God on earth. The information contained in Bennett's expose would galvanize this group of Mormons to fight the anti-Mormons with even more unrelenting zeal. This mentality causes a lot of good people to do the most heinous and absolutely evil things on the planet. This Mormon that we're talking about allows the prophet to sexually abuse their 14-year-old daughter. This Mormon doesn't argue with authority. This Mormon follows every jot and tittle of every word that falls out of the prophet's mouth. This Mormon kills their own child if that child is labeled as an apostate, an anti-Mormon, hell-bent on destroying the church. This Mormon is handsomely rewarded in the earthly kingdom with fine possessions of curious workmanship. Their celestial mansion will be filled with wives and progeny. This Mormon can think critically about every religion on the planet except for their own. The one true gospel can never be harmed in this Mormon's mind, even if the whole world rises in opposition to them. This Mormon leverages the Hans Mill trauma and the extermination order as justification for any evil act commanded by the prophet. You could bribe this Mormon with every piece of gold on the planet to renounce their religion. You could hold their earthly family hostage with threats of death in an effort to force them to renounce their religion. You could threaten them with bodily harm of every sort. Still, they would never back down from their convictions. These kinds of followers make the best kinds of followers when a despot is building a theocracy. These kinds of Mormons had come in handy to Joe before, and they'll continue to be very useful to him. And even more so, Joe's successor will surround himself with exclusively these people. So, What did the average Mormon do when Bennett's expose arose? They ignored it, called it persecution, they buried their heads, or they fell into one of the categories previously described. Bennett's expose did have something of a purging effect. The remaining Mormons after the end of 1842, well, Joe could rest assured that they would never depart from his side. Well, (laughs) at least for the most part. All right, that's going to do it for today. You heard that this episode was brought to you by Jay Mumford. I would just want to take a second to thank him. Jay is somebody who has been with us since the beginning of this podcast. He has been a a strong supporter of, since the very beginning, he was one of the very first patrons that that ever signed up. And beyond that, what's really cool is I, uh, well, I don't want to reveal too much about Jay, but needless to say, he has a certain set of skills that uh, I, I remember when I first started, I spoke with him on the phone for quite some time. I believe it was two separate interactions. It may have been just one really long interaction. I'm trying to remember back three years right now. But um, he gave me some sage advice, some some life coaching that I needed at the time. And um, I just want to say, uh, Jay, for for being there since the beginning and for helping um, in ways that you you truly can't understand for honestly altering th- the trajectory of uh, of my career in podcasting in a very slight ways. And beyond that, for your continued support, Jay has sent me a number of fascinating news articles. He's, I don't know how to say this, um, but he is uh, endearingly old school in that he writes, he hand writes notes to me, folds them up in an envelope and, and sends them to me personally. And usually with a donation entail um, and oftentimes with a newspaper Newspaper clippings. He's not somebody who emails me a link. A link. He cuts out a newspaper article, plops it in an envelope, and mails it to me. It's I, I I'm just sitting back and appreciating it because it's it's something that it's tangible. It's real. It's not something that I you know I I throw together a three minute reply in an email and hit send and then it's something that's out of my life. It's something that comes to me and then it sits on my desk and then I get to look at it and hold the, the letter in my hand and then I open it and then I have my little 
I don't know what else to call it. I have my little Mumford pile of of uh, letters and of newspaper articles that he sent to me. That's just my keepsake pile right here on my desk, and it's it, they're always very positive. And he's he recently gave a significant donation, which has allowed me to. Um, well, it's allowed a little bit of extra spending money during the Europe trip, and more importantly, it bought a new microphone um, because w- w- he he gave a donation to the My Book of Mormon podcast fund, and that bought Marie's new microphone. That's that's the the Jay Mumford mic. The uh, yeah, um, and this this microphone that he he purchased for me because of his donation, it's a microphone that I'm going to take with me to the John Whitmer conference coming up here next week, and. It's one, well, when this podcast airs, it is actually, I'm, I'm going to be there in Missouri at the conference, and it's a microphone that I'm actually going to take with me and get much better sound quality for the interviews that I'll be conducting and bringing back to you guys and airing. So for that, Jay Mumford has, um, he has increased the quality of this show, not only just in the what you're hearing, the raw audio that's going to come into your headphones when I am talking to you and talking to somebody else through those headphones, but also in ways that are much less quantifiable. And for everything, for all of your unwavering support, Jay, thank you. Thank you very much from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Also, I wanted to give a little heads up. I was recently tagged in a post about this uh, this Hushed Ones documentary. If any of you have seen the McKenna Denson video where she goes up and bears her testimony, I don't know if that's the right way of saying it, in Joseph Bishop's ward, and there's a whole backstory to this. Uh, if you don't understand what I'm talking about and you want more information, nakedmormonism at gmail.com. I'll get you up to speed, but... Uh, at the end of that video where McKenna Denson is being, you know, forcibly removed from the stand, she, uh, they, they show at the end of the screen, the hushed ones, the hushed ones, it's a documentary that's coming and it is detailing the, the decades of covering up of sexual abuse that the church has been perpetuating. And I want to talk about it on this platform because it's larger than the glass box podcast platform. And there are more people that are going to hear this. The Hushed Ones documentary has a Kickstarter up, and I personally pledged um, to support it because I think it's it's an important cause, and it's not only detailing McKenna Denson and the MTC sexual abuse scandal that is currently playing out in the court system and the alleged cover-up that has happened there, but also wrapping it up into the Protect LDS Children and Sam Young with um, his excommunication trial just happened. And at the time I'm recording this, he has yet to appear on uh, Temple Square and open the letter. We'll find out in a couple of days from when I'm recording when that is going to come. When you're listening to this, that's already happened. But this Hush Ones documentary is, in my opinion, is something very important that I think should be launched. So if there, uh, if you feel like having a documentary out there, having more eyes on what goes on behind closed doors within the church. When you see the history of the church and you see the foundation, when you see that it was created by somebody who was a serial sexual predator, and you see that that is something that is perpetuated in the culture of Mormonism since its foundation, um, needless to say, in my opinion, more eyes need to be on this. So you can check the show notes or you can Google Hushed Ones Documentary and find their Kickstarter if you think that it's a worthy cause to get it out there and get more eyes on this issue. So with all of that, I want to thank everybody for listening. Thank all of those of you who support the show over at patreon.com slash naked Mormonism. And for everybody who downloads, rates, emails, gets in touch on social media, thank you all so very much. I hope to talk at you next time here on the Naked Mormonism Podcast.
This podcast is produced with the help of Julie Briscoe as production assistant and director of social media, and Brian Ziegenhagen as audio engineer. Music is produced by Jason Camo from a aloststateofmind.com and is used with permission. Naked Mormonism is a production of Ground Gnome Studios, LLC. Copyright 2018. All rights reserved.